delighted to welcome you to this film marking the publication of Volume 12 in the Documents and Irish Foreign Policy series. Over 20 years ago, the first volume in the series was published, and in that time, relationships between the National Archive, the Royal Irish Academy, and the Department of Foreign Affairs have gone from strength to strength. I want to express our thanks and congratulations to the dedicated team that made this volume possible. The editors, Dr. Michael Kennedy, Professor Eunan O'Halpin, and Professor Bernadette Whelan, and assistant editors, Dr. John Gibney and Dr. Owen Kinsella. Volume 12 runs from 1961 to 1965. It covers themes that resonate across the decades to the heart of contemporary Irish foreign policy. Firstly, there is Ireland's activist role in the United Nations, in particular the championing by Minister for External Affairs, Frank Aiken, of nuclear disarmament, which was encompassed in UN General Assembly Resolution 1665 in 1961, known as the Irish Resolution, and it led to the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Most significantly in the context of the coming weeks, in 1962, Ireland began the first of what, from January 2021, will be our fourth term on the UN Security Council. That 1962 term, of course, coincided with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Secondly, the volume covers Ireland's progress towards membership of the EEC. We see the growing significance of European integration to Ireland. Taoiseach Sean Lamas, uh, his ultimate foreign policy goal was membership of the European Economic Community. Thirdly, Lamas's desire to improve and strengthen the relationships between Dublin, London and Belfast. In particular, uh, his summits with Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Captain Terence O'Neill, in spring 1965. These meetings, the first since 1925, set in place a rolling agenda of cross-border cooperation which continues today. The world of the early 1960s was a dangerous place, where local conflicts could become Cold War flashpoints, Volume 12 covers the era-defining Defence Forces deployments in Congo in 1960 and from 1964 in Cyprus. Ireland's involvement in peacekeeping continues and today our Defence Forces personnel serve in almost a dozen locations across the globe. Since 1958, not a day has gone by that Irish troops have not been on duty for the UN. There is a richness to this volume. I might mention also the first steps in creating a development aid policy and the return to Ireland from Britain in 1965 of the remains of the executed 1916 leader, Roger Casement, an Irish patriot now recognised uh, as the formative voice in the uh, international protection of human rights. Casement's legacy continues to inspire us today. Finally, I'm delighted to officially declare that volume 12 of documents on Irish foreign policy will now take its place in this fine series. It will be a valuable resource for us all for many years to come. Thank you very much. This is, after all, a historical document of some importance. And our function is not to gloss over facts of this nature, but on the contrary, to record them. When the report is published, as it may be perhaps in 50 years or so, we will all be dead. And even if it is shown, we were mistaken in our conviction about the authenticity of the remains. It will not hurt us or indeed our memories over much. celebrating the publication of the 12th volume in the Documents on Irish Foreign Policy series, I would like to begin by thanking Minister Simon Coveney for his support for the DIFP and for his department's strong commitment to the series since 1997. With its focus on the United Nations and on European integration, DIFP 12 provides the historical foundations to many of the signature themes of 21st century Irish foreign policy. On behalf of the National Archives, I want to welcome this most recent publication in the documents on Irish foreign policy. 
Since 1997, this has been an important collaboration for the National Archives, working with the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Royal Irish Academy, because it has allowed us to deliver on our statutory remit under the 1986 National Archives Act, which is to ensure public access to government records and departmental files after 30 years. This particular project, exploring the records and the files of the Department of Foreign Affairs, helps us to better understand our place in the world. And we look forward to continuing this partnership over further editions. The 16th session of the General Assembly meets today in the shadow of an immense tragedy, in the midst of deep and heartfelt mourning, which extends far beyond the walls of this chamber to millions of men and women throughout the world. In introducing our draft resolution, the Minister indicated that his basic objective was to prevent the danger of nuclear war from becoming greater during the period of time needed to evolve and strengthen a generally accepted system of world security based on international law and law enforcement. It will be our earnest and constant aim as a member of the Security Council to contribute to the utmost of our possibilities to the success of the Council's efforts to maintain international peace and security and to uphold the provisions of the Charter. For us, this is not merely a question of our duty as a loyal member of the United Nations, it is a matter of high national interest as well. I desire to emphasise that the political aims of the community are aims to which the Irish government and people are ready to subscribe and in the realisation of which they wish to play an active part. As I have already said, the Irish nation has always had a strong sense of belonging to Europe. We are also very conscious of the great advantages which can accrue to all the countries concerned and to world peace from a strong and united Europe. We have applied for membership of the EEC because it would be economic disaster for us to be outside the community if Britain is in it. We cannot afford to have our advantageous position in the British market turned into one of exclusion by a tariff wall, 
particularly as our chief competitors would be inside this wall. Ms. Murphy, Department of External Affairs, has informed me that the Taoiseach has agreed with the Minister for External Affairs that we should support the US stand on Cuba. The Taoiseach is to speak to the Minister at about 1pm today on the exact nature of our reply. Meanwhile, the Americans are being told that we are sympathetic. It's a massive assistance of the Soviet uh, Union. This clearly amounts to much more than a mere strengthening of Cuba's defenses against invasion. It involves the stationing on Cuban territory of the latest types of military weapons manned by Soviet technicians and capable by their power and range of striking a deadly blow against all the principal cities and industrial centers of the American continent. It's difficult for us, as it must be for others, to understand the reasons which led the Soviet government, given the present state of tension existing throughout the world, to take a step which has the effect of upsetting the existing delicate balance of world security. Mr. Kennedy's election has done more to enhance our position with the senior officials in the government than any possible extra American development could do. In the popular psychological jargon, the image of Ireland in the State Department was the image of the Boston Irish more than any other. And the Boston Irish have not been respectable in the eyes of the men at the top in the State Department. Now, all of a sudden, they have become respectable with a vengeance. My colleagues in the Irish government and I have been profoundly shocked by the tragic death of President Kennedy. By this dreadful event, the world has lost a great leader in whose courage, integrity and wisdom rested the hopes of mankind for an enduring peace. We mourn his passing as a personal loss in Ireland, the country of his ancestors, where only a few months ago we welcomed him with so much pride and affection. We ask you to accept our heartfelt sympathy on the passing of an outstanding president, a wise and courageous world leader, and a great American. At the special request of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, Assistant Secretary of State Crockett asked Ambassador McCluskey to approach the Taoiseach, Mr. Lamas, to arrange to have a contingent of the Irish Army fly to Washington to participate in the funeral ceremonies of the late President Kennedy on Monday next. Mr. Lamas gave his immediate consent and a contingent from the Officer Cadet School will leave Dublin tomorrow on the same plane as President de Valera. General McKeown, the Chief of Staff, will accompany the contingent.
Ireland takes the view, moreover, that European countries have a moral responsibility and an interest to ensure that those new countries are assisted to conduct their affairs in a manner calculated to serve, at one and the same time, both their own best interests and the interests of peace. The Minister would also be reluctant to send Irish troops into a situation where they might be accused of supporting the type of partition that exists at present in Cyprus, or some other form of partition that might be agreed upon there in the future. The main argument which may be advanced in favour of urging us to send an Irish contingent to Cyprus is that we are one of the very few countries acceptable to all the parties involved. In the past, there has been reluctance to accede to requests for the transfer to Ireland of the remains of Roger Casement because it was thought that the granting of the request might involve the risk of reawakening memories of past differences. So far from this being the case, the government and all the political parties here feel very strongly that the transfer to Ireland of Casement's remains will remove an unnecessary irritant in the relations between our two countries and would rebound to the credit of the British government which sanctioned it. Mr Wilson pulled up a seat and subsided into it. He then turned to me, remarking that the British government must be very popular in Ireland just now. I made some remarks to the effect that the British governments were usually popular in Ireland when they tried to see things our way a little bit. Inside, we sat around the fire in the Prime Minister's office. Captain O'Neill, who had described the meeting at lunch as a historic one, meriting champagne, began by saying how glad he was that it had at last come about. And the Taoiseach replied that he had been anxious for a meeting for some years to explore possibilities of practical cooperation in the interests of the whole of Ireland. Thank you on behalf of the editors of DIFP, Inanna Halpin, Bernadette Whelan and myself, to all who made Volume 12 of the series possible. Minister, we are indebted to you for the support that you've given DIFP over the years. We would like to thank you and Secretary General Niall Burgess for the opportunity that you've given us to develop an engaging partnership between your department, the Royal Irish Academy and the National Archives of Ireland. At the Royal Irish Academy, we'd like to thank President Mary Canning, Executive Director, Dr Tony Gaynor, and all our colleagues, but in particular DIFP's assistant editors, Dr Owen Kinsella and Dr John Gibney. Through the Academy, DIFP has become a central part of the infrastructure for the study of modern Irish history. Without the archives of the Department of Foreign Affairs, under the care of the National Archives, uh, there would be no DIFP. And we would like to thank the Director of the Archives, Orla McBride, and her colleagues, uh, Tom Quinlan and Conservator Zoe Reid. And of course, we'd like to thank the staff of the Reading Room, our daily points of contact, those who provide us with the files from which we take the documents for each volume. 
We rely heavily on collections of private papers and I would like to thank here Kate Manning and her colleagues at UCD Archives for their generosity and their help for us. And we would not have Volume 12 of DIFP were it not for the immense effort put into it by our publishing consultants, the Institute of Public Administration. Our thanks to Director of Publishing, Dr Richard Boyle, and to Hannah Ryan, who undertook much of the day-to-day -day work on the volume and who shows that it is possible to move mountains. When you open Volume 12, realise that there is a team behind every word. Maura O'Shea typed, Brendan O'Brien copy edited, Carol Lynch typeset, Janita Clancy indexed, Thank you all for your commitment and your professionalism to producing the volume. The editors of DIFP work together as a team, and the strength of the, that team is how we each edit the volume. So as well as speaking on behalf of the editors tonight, I would like to thank all my colleagues personally for making DIFP 12 possible. I do hope you enjoy volume 12, and thank you for watching.